Welcome to the Contemplative Life. Three pastors, friends, and spiritual companions help us explore spirituality through a contemplative lens. I'm Christina Roberts. I'm Chris Roberts. I'm Christina Kaiser. We're glad you joined us. Hello. It's great to be with you. For the last several weeks now, we've been talking with individuals from varying fields and areas of expertise in order to hear how other people navigate self-care given their unique set of circumstances besides just the three of us here. And if you've been following along, you may have heard us mention this term community care a couple of weeks ago in episode 157. And then interestingly enough, it came up again the following week after we stopped recording. And so today we thought it might be nice to not just reference the term, but actually talk about it. What is community care? How is it done? Why is it important? And so to kick us off, we thought we'd share a quote from Mia Mingus. Just a little bit of background. Mia is a writer, educator, and trainer for transformative and disability justice. And she writes this. She says, we want to move away from the myth of independence that everyone can and should be able to do everything on their own. She continues on to say, I'm fighting for an interdependence that embraces need and tells the truth that no one does it on their own. And the myth of independence is just that, a myth. And so maybe we can start there. As we hear Mia's words, what do you think? What comes up for you? I'm so glad we're talking about this because I think in each one of our self-care episodes, there were threads of this idea of community care, whether it was somebody referencing, I was having a hard time and so I went to see a therapist because my spouse encouraged me to do that. Or I have a group that I meet with regularly and we discuss ideas and collaborate or whatever it is. And so I think this idea of self-care just being personal, while it's hugely personal and each person that we interviewed as well as us here on the screen, have our own private practices that we do. The importance of community care and involving others in that, to me, cannot be overexpressed. And so I'm really glad that we're broaching this topic today. I'm glad we're talking about it, too. Even from just a personal standpoint, I think, and I was processing this again, not only we're going to talk about it today, but it has not come easy for me to allow myself to move outside of the concept of independence. So I appreciate that she's even saying independence is a myth. It's you may have thought that you could do it, but you can't. And I even think of just simple things in my home. Like I just thought I have to do these things. I have to do them because I am the person that's supposed to do them. And then someone else will say, your kids can learn to do laundry or something like this. And I'll think, oh, (laughs) it didn't even occur to me to ask my family to be helpful, much less we start to think through what does that look like in the workplace and in our holistic needs overall. I think that something that comes up for me is what you guys are talking about independence and community, but I was reading a book a couple of years back and it was talking about solitude being the gift that one gives themselves to give back to community. And uh, I think Solitude is a super important aspect of being fully who you are in a community. And Henry Nowen, the prolific author, says solitude is where community begins. Uh, That's where we listen to God. And thinking of life as a big wagon wheel with many spokes and in the middle is the hub. And often in life, people try to run around the edge of the wagon wheel, but he's, he said, start in the hub, live in the hub, and then we'll be connected with all the spokes and we won't have to run so fast. So as we think about community care, I, I think solitude is a great place to start because it is being connected to the center of oneself, being connected to the divine, and then you're more connected to others around you all the spokes, as Henry now would describe it. Yeah, I think it's important to acknowledge that both in, I was recently listening to a podcast and it was the scientists talking about the five types of relationships that we need in order to thrive and studying different parts of the world and people that live a long life or a quality life. 
And one of the five is relationships to ourselves, right? Which I think would include some of what was highlighted, right? Like my relationship with myself might include a personal trainer or my best friend that I go on a walk with on Tuesdays or whatever it is, right? But then the other four have to do with others and in what ways am I contributing and what ways am I feeling a sense of belonging, et cetera. And so I think it is that both and. But as we're talking in this context of care, like the community care piece, I think it it's both a giving and a receiving. There are times when maybe I'm going through a struggle in my life and when people are showing up with, whether it's a practical thing that I need help with or a prayer or whatever, that strengthens me and helps me to carry on type of a thing. And in the same way, when I'm giving and I'm contributing into my community, I feel a sense of, wow, like something that I did today made somebody else's life a little bit easier or better. And of course, we get the oxytocin, the chemical hits from that that are designed to be there. And so I love kind of the reciprocity and recognizing that if we're going to have sustainable, good, thriving lives, community just has to be a part of that in a variety of forms, I would say. Yeah, I would agree with that. And it's funny. Some of the stuff with solitude that you're talking about reminds me, so, and I've brought this up, I think, on other podcasts, but in the interspiritual meditation format that Ed Bastian created, the seventh kind of prayer step is, may we be in service to all beings. So there is a sense of like filling up and where does this love go? The receiving and extending that you're talking about, Christina, it's very difficult to have that ability to connect with the community when we feel so tired. And many of our guests over the last few weeks have talked about, and I think Sarah Kaiser in the, it was a healthcare one. She does a great job of saying, I am working alone in this particular area. And so my connection with my colleagues once a month is really important to me. That community is a really important aspect of it. But it is interesting that for some of us, we develop this kind of muscle, if you will, out of maybe like we were thrust into it. So I know people, for example, whose spouses got sick when they had young children. And so they had to get used to asking for what they needed and drawing that I don't need this, I do need that. And then that becomes even more. So one lady that I knew, her husband then passed away and things would happen. Like the fence would break and she thought, I have no idea how to fix this. And so there was this honing of that community muscle, whereas some of us might go for a long time limping along, trying to just do it ourselves. I've been talking to a lot of individuals about the loneliness epidemic and what both of you are saying about being connected to something greater than yourself, I think is so foreign to the current climate. Like people just go through life ex expecting to be lonely, ex expecting to the, have to do everything on their own or not do it at all. And so I love that we're talking about building community care. And I just wonder what are the invitations that, that people are seeing into community? I think community is a wonderful thing that could benefit everyone, but our systems and structures are breaking down. I think there are less people going to church. I think even I asked a friend about AA and how many people are going to institutions like AA now compared to way back when. And I think where do people go for community when all of our systems and structures are breaking down? And I don't have an answer to that, but I think community has to be more important than ever. And I think invitations, inviting people into something greater than oneself is probably what we need to start looking into these invitations, inviting people into community. Yeah, we recently here had a pretty bad snowstorm and we live across the street from a, a widow whose sister was in the hospital and her dog was, she was dog sitting and the dog was having some respiratory problems and she called and was needing to take the dog to the vet, was a little bit scared to drive. She's in her 70s. And we couldn't help her at the time, take the dog, because um, we had some other things that we had to tend to. But we asked one of our kids who's 13 and said, hey, the neighbor is having a, a hard time. Would you want to drive with her for, for moral support? So she's like, yep, got dressed, went over there. And that just made all the difference, like having her in the car to tend to the dog and to be a calming voice. And the neighbor was crying because 
her sister's in the hospital struggling, the dog's struggling, she's stressed. And just to have that presence in the car with her meant something. And so I think sometimes community care, like you're mentioning, Christina, the fence is broken, the practical things that we can do. It really is an emotional support that gets somebody through that. And my daughter came back from that experience. And I know the neighbor was really appreciative of that. And my daughter had a different perspective of, wow, like, I'm really glad that it was scary for me to be in that car and to be with her. But she had a presence about her and I think really was glad that she was able to, to foster that. And so I think just these little things that I think we can do and just paying attention, noticing the needs and not that we can meet every need all the time, but I think some just we couldn't meet it, but one of our kids could in that moment and just recognizing some of those opportunities. It's funny what you're saying reminds me of another woman who writes about these things and she interchanges this word squad care to talk about community care. So her name is Melissa Harris Perry. She's also an author, a professor, and a social justice advocate. She says this. She says, self-care implies that caring for ourselves is a private, individual act that we need only to detach ourselves from our web of relations and then spend our resources on respite or pampering. But care is labor that we all do for one another in seen and unseen ways. She says what we need is squad care, which reminds us there is no shame in reaching for each other and insists the imperative rests not with the individual, but the community. I think the story that you're bringing up just so reminds me of that. And when I first encountered this quote, I encountered it while teaching a class where one of the possible activities was this reflective exercise where there were these circles on the page and you would consider what are the various areas of need in my life and who are my people that I engage with. And it was this whole invitation to think through that and then ask yourself, do those people know that they would be my people? Have I asked those people into my experience or not? Which it's a little bit of a scary, it's a vulnerable exercise, but I think a meaningful one. So I don't know. You may have other things that arise as you hear this quote. Yeah, I think building off of that, Christina, I a few years ago was maybe similar. I didn't. I love that term that the squad. That's a great way to, to describe it. But this woman was talking about different types of relationships that she needs in her life and everything from I need someone to laugh with. I need someone that cares where I'm at all times. I need someone all these things. And she wrote this all out. And I did that exercise myself. And there's something about putting names to that and recognizing because I think sometimes we can feel like is there anybody? <laughs> Who are the people, right? But actually, no, there are. And one of my favorite quotes about spiritual guidance is to take a long, loving look at what is real. And I think sometimes there's so much that's real and we don't take the time to take that long, loving look and to recognize, you know what, if my car does break down, there's three people that I could call that I know would help me or et cetera. And so I, I really appreciate what you're naming there. Yeah, I really uh, have enjoyed this conversation and what both of you have brought forward there's a song that one of my children loves to sing, and it makes me think of this conversation, but it's Major Tom to Ground Control. And another line, is there anybody out there? And I think there are people out there. And I think what I hear us saying is like the noticing, paying attention to the bids. I think people sometimes offer us bids. Our neighbor called and said, hey, I, I, she didn't ask me directly if you could go, but she said, I've got to do this and just sharing what it is that she has going on. And of course I said, let me check and see if my daughter can go with you. And I think paying attention to the bids that people give us seems super important to this conversation. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. This notion of it's just a little invitation in because most of us, we're not trained again at asking for help. And so we won't necessarily say it outright. And I was so fortunate at one point to have friends who would pay really close attention to that. We moved and so they can't do that in the same way, but they would try to reach out. And we can watch the kids. You guys can go do something fun. And I was very like, no, I don't want to put you out. And it, this paying attention to the biz is a really good way to put it. And Christina, you mentioned spiritual companionship. I, I know that we're all spiritual directors and therefore maybe have a bias here, but it's amazing to me if I look at life before and life after, like in terms of the notion of setting up community care for ourselves, even that little bit of a one-on-one, -on -one, the long loving look that you're talking about, 
so meaningful and so helpful. And I just sat the other day with a group of spiritual directors in training who were reflecting on their own walk and experience in this. And one of them said, this stuff really works. And I think that is the surprise when we have people that come along and act as companions to us in some way, how that changes life and our experience of life. It really is a filling experience. Yeah. And I like what you're saying too, Chris, about the bids. And the other weekend, we were watching one of our kids' sports events and talking with one of the parents. And I had both a giving and and receiving. So the time before, this parent was talking about having to move their mother out of her home into a different living situation. And so I asked, oh, how's your mom liking the new place, right? Because this was several weeks ago. And I think she was shocked that I, she was like caught off guard and she's, oh, and proceeded to tell me about the new place, et cetera. And so again, just like that little piece of exchange. And then another thing happened where our kid was something upset, this child, and she was crying on the bench at the game. And so all the parents are like, what's going on? Da, da, da. And so then the following game, one of the dads actually came up to Chris and, and was checking in on our kid. And is she OK? And what's going on? I'm like, wow, like you remember that? And that was just really kind that you would take the time to do that. And I felt a sense of community care that someone noticed that my child was struggling and he didn't talk to her. He wasn't part of the solution, but just the noticing and acknowledging that they were part of that really so again, I think on both ends, that was a neat experience that I had. Again, I think sometimes community bear care can be simple of a two-minute conversation of noticing something, or sometimes it can be taking an hour or more out of your day or doing a rhythmic thing to, to help somebody. But I think there's, again, just all different ways to express this. I really appreciate that. I think that kind of little start or that little noticing can be so helpful. And I've been there too. Just recently, there was a big snowstorm and the neighbors were sledding down the hill in our front yard with our kids. And then another neighbor went by and was sh- doing the shovel thing. I have no idea. The shovel thing is all I got. But it went round and round, this rolly brush on various driveways. And we, we got to wave and I thought, look, community, it's happening. Because when you move, it can take a while to build that. So I like what you're saying. It's kind of small beginnings and then see where it goes. Thank you to both of you for this conversation today. May there be many sparks as a result of it. And now is the time in our podcast where we take a moment to talk about what we are into. So tell me, what are you into today? I know we've been talking a lot about snow. And so when I first moved to Madison early on, I bought a pair of snowshoes and those like walking pole things and used them a few times and then they sat. But I recently got out just the poles, not the the whole snowshoe thing, but the pole. I've been walking in the woods with my poles and oh my gosh, I love it. It's just, I don't know. There's something about, cause we, I think we got maybe 18 inches so far this season. So there's a lot of snow in the woods to work through and just having that. And it's just been such a beautiful release and the peaceful calm of the snows on the tree. So I am into winter walking with my little snow poles. I was recently going through a box that had some of my music pedals and electric guitar pedals that I was looking for a a specific manual. And I found a box that had my Ebo in it. And the Ebo is a device that you use on electric guitar to make it sound like you're putting a, a smooth bow action to the electric guitar. And so it creates really smooth sounds as you, you play a, a lead on the neck. And I've been messing around with my Ebo, not so much on my electric guitar, but I'm seeing what kind of fun sounds I can get on my acoustic guitar. And it doesn't work very well. You have to be very precise with it to to get some of that vibration on the string. But I've been having a lot of fun with my Ebo. Those are both very exciting and fun things. I have been in or back into, in a way, barrel sizes for curling irons uh, for many years now. I have straightened my hair because it's faster and it's predictable. But I find myself in a community theater show that's coming up in a couple of weeks. So I've been experimenting with how much curl do I want in my hair for this show, which has brought the kids to all sorts of oohs and ahs because they think that I am only one way. So that is my thing for the, the moment. Thank you so much, everyone, for being with us. And we will look forward to being with you again soon. 
If you enjoy listening to the podcast, we invite you to stay connected by signing up for our Foundry Spiritual Center newsletter, where you can learn about even more programs and offerings. You'll find a link to subscribe in the show notes or visit us anytime at foundrysc.com. Thanks again for being with us. We hope you have a great week.